Right, and what I hear from you saying is that, um, you know, you feel like there are some plausible answers and ways that you could uh, answer those to where you can hold this view as kind of the best view. And, and you know, I, like, I want to say something that I really appreciate, Greg, uh, how you re- wrote in um, The Benefit of the Doubt, I think. You talked about having a degreed faith where instead of this binary on-off, all yeah, yeah. or nothing, but you kind of proportion your belief according to the evidence. So it seems to me like you're really comfortable just saying, yeah, you know, this, I'm like, I'm like an 80% on this one or something. Mm, sure, sure, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I encourage people to have a concentric circles model of faith rather than a house of cards model uh, where everything's got to be equally certain and if you knock out one peg, the whole thing comes tumbling down. It's a very vulnerable way to hold your faith in the, the postmodern world in which we live today. Um, I think a more biblical and a more advantageous way is to I have a defining center, which I take to be the crucified Christ. That's the center of everything for me, where I want to get all my life and worth and significance. And uh, I want to be most confident about that, and I want to leverage everything on that. And then the, uh, the next ring would be, for me, the authority of Scripture. Um, uh, since I believe in Jesus as Lord, I, I want to believe in, in uh, he, he seemed to endorse Scripture, so I want to endorse it. Uh, and then the no- next ring would be like the ecumenical creeds that Christians have always believed. Then there's the realm of doctrines, which are ways of interpreting the dogma, and then there are all opinions. And the farther out you go from the center, uh, the less you should leverage on it, the less impact it should have on you if you end up being wrong. Um, And if you're getting all your life from Christ, then you don't need to be getting it from trying to be right on all your opinions. Uh, So you're able to say maybe, you know, kind of inclined towards whatever. So uh, on this one, um, yeah, I I could be wrong on everything I'm going to say here on the show, and uh, it wouldn't upset my basic identity in the least. Right. See, that's that's wonderful, Greg. And you know, I've talked to a lot of people, and some people it seems they get like an emotional connection to this doctrine. And so, if you challenge it, yeah, you're challenging the Bible itself, or even ah, worse, you're challenging yeah. Jesus Himself, because their pastor has said over and over, you know, Jesus talked more about hell than anything. And uh, so, if you're rethinking this issue, well, you're rethinking the words of Jesus, and that's just not safe for people. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they identify their. Their map is the territory, and so they identify their interpretation of Scripture with Scripture itself. So to disagree with them is to disagree with Scripture. Um, yeah, and it's, it's hard to have a calm discussion with folks uh, who are so locked into their position. Right. Well, let's get back to that center you were talking about, because, you know, Greg, I heard you in your sermons a lot. Um, which, by the way, you can find Greg's uh, sermon podcast in iTunes if you just search for Woodland Hills. I encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, but, Greg, I've heard you talking there a lot that the center of your theology, like you just said, uh, is this Christocentric hermeneutic, where you see this nonviolence as the center of God's self revelation in Christ. So, you said many times that when you look at Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of his enemies, He's not holding it against them. He's even praying for them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Mm -hmm. At that moment, you are seeing most clearly the true heart of God. Yes, yeah. Now, here's my question then. If that's right, this Christocentric, this this cruciform uh, hermeneutic, how do you square that with biblical teaching on hell from what you see? Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, Well, part of my, uh, this cruciform hermeneutic, as you say, uh, is that I, I, I've come to believe that we should start all of our questions about God, uh, the attributes of God, activities of God, theology in general, at, with the cross. Uh, because I, I do think it, it is the definitive revelation. It's the, the Hebrew says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory, which means that when God shines, it looks like Jesus. And uh, he is the uh, exact representation of, of God's hypostasis, his very essence. So uh, I, I, I keep my eyes fixed on the cross. And... Um, uh, now, what I learned about God's judgment on the cross is this. Uh, the only thing the Father did, uh, Jesus stood in our place and bore the consequences of sin that we deserve. That's, that's the judgment. But uh, all the Father did was deliver him over um, and um, uh, allowing wicked human beings and wicked angels to do what they wanted to do. And that was the death consequences of the sin of the world that he bore. Uh, but there was no violence on the Father's part here. It was just his withdrawing and letting this violence take place. And that's why Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and then when I read the scripture through that lens, I find it confirmed all over the place. I have two chapters, 50 pages apiece, 
of just exegeting scripture where you know the, the Lord's dealing with Israel and and he stays in the game as long as he can with his mercy wanting to protect them from the consequences of the rebellion always warning them that there could come a point where he's going to withdraw and then Babylon or Assyria or their enemies are going to have their way and the, then there are times where he does that uh, but he doesn't engage in the violence against them it's Babylon and Assyria and the other enemies and, and when, when, when he withdraws it's with a grieving heart and that too we get from looking at Jesus because as he's writing him to Jerusalem uh, he announces this judgment that's coming on, on, on Jerusalem uh, that you know people are going to be slaughtered uh, it's not, that, not God that's going to slaughter them it's going to be the Romans but God sees this coming and he wails it says he cries as he's announcing this judgment and that reveals the heart of God when it comes to judgment but it's a matter of God withdrawing and so if we understand the final judgment this way um, it, it's not about God acting violently to get even uh, I, I see God as just he'll, he'll, he, he will work with a person as long as there's any hope of them turning uh, but there, may, there can come a point where it, it's hopeless they're so solidified in the rebellion against him that God has no choice but to withdraw. And, and since God is the one who is sustaining all things, if he ever withdraws his creative hand, uh, then people uh, vanish. Um, and that is, on the one hand, an act of judgment. It's a judgment, and it's, it's terrifying, and people need to be warned about that. On the other hand, it's, it's an act of mercy. Uh, because if he didn't do that, then they would go forever in this miserable, terrible state that they're in. Uh, and so it's kind of divine euthanasia. Um, God just, uh, uh, with a grieving heart, lets them go. As Western people tend to read uh, forensic punishment into the Bible, when the Bible usually is talking about an organic punishment, um, the, the, way, the general way of, of construing the relationship between uh, sin and punishment in the Bible is to see the punishment as a natural consequence of the sin. And you have all these verses on this, like you, uh, the violence that you intend is going to recoil against you, the, 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 uh, the pit that you dug, hoping your enemy would fall into it, well, you're going to fall into your own uh, you know, trap. It all, there's a ricochet effect, and that's why evil is inherently self-destructive. So punishment in the Bible, it, it's, it's a judgment of God in that he's, he's the creator and set up this world this way, but it's also just inherent in the behavior that it will lead to these consequences. It's, it's more like uh, getting emphysema if you smoked all your life, then it is like being thrown into prison because you stole a, you know, a candy bar. Um, it's not imposed from without, it's rather structured from within. And the judgment is that God simply lets that take its course. Uh, and, and so in a real sense, we bring judgment upon ourselves, which again, the Bible says over and over again. Yeah, Greg, I really like this. I, I love what you're saying here. and um, it's connected well, Thank you. Yeah, it's connecting a lot of stuff for me. I mean, I, I've personally been... Uh, trying to study uh, punishment and the nature of punishment yeah. lately, and I, like the difference between what's I guess been called retributus, uh, yep. retributus yep. to this yep. <laughs> ju yeah, yeah, judgment yeah, sure, versus yeah. restorative punishment, and uh, and it I guess and, and the, the, it, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what, would you talk more that, about that for us? Well, yeah, it, it, you have a uh, um, retribution versus restoration, and and uh, all throughout the Bible, you find that whenever God announces a judgment is coming. He sandwiches it between affirmations about the God he will be. His anger is but for a moment, but his mercy is forever. And so even after the harshest punishment, after Babylon comes in, he says, nevertheless, I will restore you. I'm going to have a bride and all of this. So even the judgment is for the purpose of restoration. Uh, it's like God says, you know, I want you to learn the, the, the easy way. Listen to me, and, and it will go well with you. Uh, but if you don't learn the easy way, you're going to have to learn the hard way. And that means I'm going to have to, I, I won't enable you. If you to the point where you're not getting it through my mercifully teaching you, uh, then I'll have to withdraw, and you'll suffer the consequences of, 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 your, of, of your sin. But even that is so ultimately, you'll come back to me, and you'll see that it's in your best interest uh, to not live for your own self-interest, to, to live in relationship with me. The only exception to that is in, I think, the final judgment, where there is no restoration. Uh, it is still in the best interest of the person, because to go on would be eternal suffering, and so even that is done for the sake of the other, uh, but it's, it's not restorative. It's simply withdrawal.